What is happening, everyone? Thank you for tuning in to KMRD Radio Stuff. My name is Mike. Welcome to Mailbag Monday. Number 19. Guys, if you have a question that you would like to see featured on Mailbag Monday, shoot me an email, k8mrd at icloud.com. And in the subject, do put Mailbag Monday. That way I will see your email amongst the many other emails that I get that I don't care about. <laughs> Guys, let's get right in. We've got a lot of good questions today. And the first one is about Field Day, which is coming up. This viewer writes, My question is regarding how to get involved in the upcoming Field Day experience. I live in Southern California and want to visit a Field Day operation in my area. I have 40 years of experience and have an old-time extra class license. 20 words per minute. The problem I'm having is trying to locate the Field Day sites in my area. Is there a database that I can use to look up the locations of the field day sites in my area? If not, what is the next best solution? I love playing radio, but I'm having a very difficult time connecting with other like-minded hams. So my first advice to you would be, uh, I mean, if you're in the Los Angeles area, I know just because Josh is out there that there's no shortage of repeaters and people on uh, just 146.52 simplex. The first thing I would do is simply get on as many repeaters as you can hit and start talking to people and, and say, where's field day what, or, or what's a good field day site to go to and just start asking around. But there is another resource. And yes, there is a field day locator. So let's take a look at that. We'll hop over on the Internet machine and I'll show you how to do this. So we're going to navigate to our friends at the ARRL.org. This is their homepage. Right here, uh, where it says keyword, we're going to type in field day, if I can spell it right. And then I'm going to hit enter. And right down here is a field day station locator. This is awesome. And basically, here's a map. Now, they're going to hover on kinetic because that's where they're at. But we can zoom out and let's move the map over to Southern California. And you can see all of these places. Now, I don't really know the the geography of Southern California very much, but let's just say this one in, what is that, Whittier, maybe? Let's click on that. You can see it's W6KAT, the Rio Hondo Amateur Radio Club. Uh, GOTA, that's a get on the air station. So uh, these are, when you see a GOTA station and it says yes, this means that they're very open to the public and very welcoming. So... Like they are actively wanting to engage people to to get on the air and get into amateur radio. Uh, Here's some contact information. You can email Rick. Everybody shoot (laughs) shoot Rick an email. (laughs) Don't really do that, but um, yeah, you can email him and and ask him. You know what's going on. Maybe let's go over near uh, Ingle. Oh, Beverly Hills. That looks fancy. Um, So West LA Veterans Radio Club. There you go. They got to go to station. Maybe Topanga State Park. That could be a Parks on the Air as well. They've got to go to station where you can contact them and just, you know, shoot them an email. Say, hey, shoot them the same email you shot me and, you know, go with who's ever the most welcoming. Or uh, what I've done sometimes is is go from one field day event to another and just kind of check out everybody's station. That's a cool thing to do. Yeah, there's there's all kinds of information out there that you can take a look at and find a, uh, a field day site. Hopefully that helps you. Hopefully you see this in time. We've, we've got a week, uh, not even. <laughs> it's this weekend. Uh, but yeah, you should have enough time. If you if you see this video on Monday or Tuesday, you should be able to uh, make some contacts and hopefully get out there and have some fun. If all else fails, take your radio and go outside and play field day. You're not gonna you're not gonna have any lack of making contacts. So, but yeah, for me, field day is about the camaraderie and and you know, making friends and talk and shop and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Thanks for watching. Thanks for writing in. Next, we have a question about 100 watt. Let's call them mobile radios. This viewer writes, I'm using an ICOM 705 QRP with only 10 watts. Now, I wanted to move to a 100 watt radio now that I can tune anything from a Buddy Stick Pro to a Pac-10 NFET half wave to a Cartena. Uh, I built from the Smoke and Ape. Shout out, Clarence. Uh, I know you use a Yesu 891. I'm tired of Yesu. I shouldn't be on a first name basis with three of their tech support. Uh, that's interesting. I'm curious the, as to why. Uh, that's how often I have to call them. I want a good 100 watt radio like my 7300, which Ray says I should use. Of course, Ray's going to say that. Uh, I, there's my 7300 right there. I take it portable a lot. Uh, but I want to use it 
as a mobile radio as well. What do you suggest other than Yesu? So we've we've got a couple things going, you know, just for us or against us. We've got a couple things to address. Uh, namely, because you want a hundred watt radio and you want it for mobile, which means I, which I would think you're going to put in your car. The 7300 is out. But the 7300, if you're not planning on putting it in your car, is a perfectly capable radio of taking portable. I, I take this to the park all the freaking time. That's why it's there. Because uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's become a, a good portable radio for me now. I will say that I absolutely love my Yesu 891 and would still highly recommend it. Um, yes, I understand. Uh, maybe not to the point where you're at, but... Uh, for me, Yesu's menus are just... I mean, their radios are fantastic. I just don't like their menus. Um, but, you know, I rarely find that I really need to go into the deeper menus of the 891. It's been an absolute workhorse for me. I use it. I abuse it. I have never had a single problem with it. So I'm still going to say I recommend the 891, even though you don't want to hear that. However, there's not a lot on the market, especially in the new market. So really, the only new radio that I can think of, because Kenwood isn't making anything that I'm aware of, I, I don't know much about Kenwood, uh, would be the ICOM 7100. This goes, I just checked Gigaparts' website, I think uh, with a coupon, this is a little bit under $1,000. But this is a great radio, and if you're already familiar with the ICOM's user interface, you should feel right at home with this. It's touchscreen, it's HF, 6 meters, VHF. And UHF, it's it's a shack in a box. I have used this radio. It is a cool radio. If you want to mount, you know, in your car or something for mobile, you can do that. If you want to take it portable, you can do that. It's 100 watts, all band, all mode, all that stuff. Uh, but it's, you know, you're you're close to $1,000 where the 891, well, I haven't checked the 891. When I bought mine, it was about 600 bucks. Your other option, uh, the only one that's really kind of still relevant from ICOM would be the ICOM 7000. This is discontinued though, so you'll have to find it on the used market. And depending on how comfortable you are going on the used market, like eBay or QRZ or wherever to, to buy a radio that may or may not work, um, you know, and you'll still probably pay, I would guess maybe six hundred dollars for this on the used market. This has really held its value, but another all band, all mode transceiver. My dad has one of these. It's a cool radio. But they're not made, so there's no warranty, no none of that stuff. So um, those are really the only two that I can think of. Uh, if any of you viewers have suggestions, do leave them down in the comments. And uh, the person who wrote this, maybe read the comments and see what anyone else's suggestions are. But that's kind of it. I, honestly, I I really, really like my 891. So I, I would not discount that i don't know what your issues particularly are with yesu or why you have to call them all the time um that seems a little uh a little odd but uh if you want to go the icom route the 7100 is really the only thing in production for 100 watt mobile radios right now that uh that is not yesu so there you go great question hope that helps and uh thanks for writing in our next question has to do with spacing a fan dipole uh, this viewer is writing in your last mailbag Monday, number 18. You mentioned your first antenna was a fan dipole. Yes. My first antennas were separate 20 and 40 meter dipoles with chokes at their feed point, all homebrew. Now, after a few years, I'm planning to take the 20 meter down to adjust tuning. In the process, I want to add legs for 10 and maybe 6 meters. I'm running into one thing I can't find an answer to. What did you use to space out the legs of the fan dipole? And is there a rule of thumb to the spacing distance. So great question. Let's uh, hop outside and I will show you my very first antenna that I ever made for HF. It's a 4020 fan dipole. So take it away, Mike. So here she is in all her glory and <laughs> you'll laugh at how poorly I constructed this, but this thing works freaking amazing. So this is uh, just the MFJ one-to-one -one Ballon. I can't remember the model of it, but I'll try and throw a link in the description. And this is the actual wire coming out of the balance, kind of hard to see. And I just wrapped the 14 gauge wire around here, this eyelid a couple times for some strain relief. This is my solder connection <laughs> wrapped with electrical tape. And as far as spacers, I think I measured three inches of just PVC pipe and I drilled holes in it and that's it. And then, uh, they're, you know, like I said, they're probably about 
eh, maybe two and a half inches apart, two inches. I don't think it really matters the spacing because you're, you're tuning it against itself. Now, could you take these same lengths with a different space? That might be a different story. But as we back up here, you can see uh, there's the other separator and I just have electrical tape just to keep them all in place. Very, very crudely done. This is the first antenna I ever made. And here's the end of the 20 meter element. And you can see I just wrapped it around and you just use that to tune it. You can shorten it or lengthen it. Once it's tuned, it's pretty much done. Over the years, it does stretch a little bit, so I had to shorten it a little bit, but uh, pretty simple. And then going off way over here, I just took a single piece of the uh, pipe, and this is what I used as the insulator. This is before I had any like ceramic insulators or anything. And then this other hole, whoops, <laughs> this hole right here is where I would tie the paracord into to keep it up in the air. And then you can see again, just wrap the wire around to shorten it or lengthen it. And that's how it stayed up. And this antenna worked freaking amazing. I got, what, 40, 20, 15, and 10 on it. And with my, uh, with, with my tuner, I can tune it up for anything. I mean, I've worked like 160 meters, 80 meters on it, bands it wasn't resonant on. So you don't need much to get on the air. Just have something. Something in the air is better than nothing. So that was the dipole, and that's how I made it. So it don't, I wouldn't say, I would say don't fuss too much on spacing and stuff. Just get the antenna up in the air and you'll make contacts. So have fun. So there you can see a very crude construction. This, I mean, I was just licensed as a general and I built this antenna all by myself in, in my yard. And uh, I, I put very, well, let's say I knew very little about antennas back then and I made it work and I worked all over the freaking world with that antenna. So I didn't put any thought into how far apart I should space them. I didn't read any books on it. I just made it and it worked. Uh, but like I said out there, if I were to, you know, take those wires and put them in a different spacing, because everything affects everything with antennas, that might affect the tuning, but because that's how I built it, you know, three, four inches were those, those spacers, um, everything worked out fine and, and that antenna rocks. I'm actually, I'm actually thinking of putting it back up on the roof. I like it so much. So great question. Hope that helps. Go outside and make yourself an antenna and see what happens. That's really the, for me, that's the fun of it all. So. Cool. Thanks for writing in. Lastly, we have a great question about coax. Imagine that. This viewer writes, you've completely sold me on the superiority of Messi and Poloni coax. Well, good, because it is superior coax. Uh, and I think I'm at the point in my ham journey that I'm ready to buy a roll of cable and have on hand. What would be your recommendation for the best all-around M&P cable to start with? I primarily play around on HF a bit, uh, but would want the ability to make VHF UHF runs too. As always, your thoughts are appreciated. Taylor, P.S. I never heard you mention what logging software you use for Poto. You're just trying to have fun with me now. I'd love to know. The logging software I use for Poto is called Hammers. Hammers. So I'm going to answer this question two different ways because I, I'm not 100% sure what you actually want to do with this coax. So... Let's answer this twice. So if we hop over to Messi and Poloni's coax, I mean, you're, you're asking the best all-around coax is going to be Ultraflex 13. That is their absolute high-end, top-of-the-line coax that they make. Okay. Now, this is a big cable. This is a, a half-inch thick coaxial cable. This is thicker than LMR 400. It's thicker than, than Airborne 10. It's thicker than RG213. But it's the best. Okay. So if you're just going to be at home, never moving these cables and just connecting them to your antennas and being done with it, that's what I would go with. Now, because I can't leave well enough alone, I am a ginormous fan of the Messi and Poloni Ultraflex 7. Now, I personally use the Sahara version uh, just because it's rated for higher heat and it's 100 degrees outside where I live all the time. So... Uh, I like this, but regular Ultraflex 7, the only difference is the jacket. So basically, the, the main reason I like this, one, I mean, if, if you're kind of newer to making coax, this is going to be a lot easier to work with and, and manage. Uh, the, the thicker stuff is, is, I mean, yes, they advertise it as flexible, but you got to take that with a grain of salt. It's a big, thick, honking cable. This is one millimeter thicker than RG8X, but it has 
better characteristics and efficiency than RG213. So what that means is you have a nice manageable cable. It's not too thick. It's not too heavy. It's easy to coil, all that kind of stuff. It's easy to make runs of. It's easy to put connectors on, all that stuff. But all of your... Uh, your attenuation, your your losses are still very, very well within an acceptable range. I mean, on on HF, I mean, 10 meters, you're only 0.9 dB a loss. When you look at, uh, when you get up to uh, 70 centimeters, you're 3.7 dB a loss, which is going to be comparable or slightly better than RG213. But it, it's just an incredible coax. It's got great shielding. It's got copper foil. So, you know, it's, it's got a great resistance to outside noise from, from getting in. Uh, you've got a great high-pressure physical injection foam polyethylene dielectric. They, the, the way they inject the gas into this dielectric to make the bubbles, and this is the same with all M&P cables, is amazing. It's, just, it's an incredible dielectric with great insulating properties. And then you have 19 center conducting wires which is insane that's just a lot of freaking wires that are uh, 0.38 millimeters thick so i i am starting to use this there's actually a roll behind me you can kind of see right there uh that's a hundred meter roll of ultraflex 7 that i just picked up because i want to use more of it i've been using hyperflex 5 out in the field and uh i mean i'm talking like poda and i'm going to be switching to this i just need to throw some connectors on it and uh cut it to length for what I want but this is this is moving forward going to be pretty much my main just kind of all around workhorse coax are there better cables than this yes the ultraflex 13 the hyperflex 10 the ultraflex 10 I mean any cable bigger than this is going to be better but this is still a freaking awesome cable so I would lean you more towards the ultraflex 7 but I mean in terms of just what is the best the ultraflex 13 or the ultraflex 10 either one of those but uh, the 13 is, is the best they make. Ultraflex 7 is going to be kind of, I mean, that's, that's like I said, that's my go-to. So I hope that answers your question, and thank you for writing in. I love, love, love talking about coax. <laughs> that topic has consumed me lately. So that is going to conclude another episode of Mailbag Monday. I can't believe it's already 19. It's going to be 20 next week. Do you believe that? Uh, I hope everyone has a great field day. If you're in the south, in the Hellfire Inferno where I live, uh, make sure you stay hydrated. Bring lots of water. I know uh, some some of us like to drink some adult beverages, but make sure you're you're constantly staying hydrated. It is it is hot, hot, hot all across the country. You cannot drink too much water, you guys. If, if you see me in any of my videos, I mean, literally right here, I always, 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 always have water with me. So just stay safe and uh, most importantly, have fun. It's not a contest, even though they say it is. And uh, I hope to work many, many, many of you on the air this field day. So, guys, if you have a question you'd like to have answered, shoot me an email, k at mrd at icloud.com. In the subject, put Mailbag Monday, and uh, maybe you'll be featured on an episode of Mailbag Monday. <laughs> guys, thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And we will see you again on another episode of k at mrd Radio Stuff. 73, guys. Uh -huh.